Beth? I think just um, an intro to the intro. Um, you know, a lot of this is reporting back on on the on the kind of feedback we've gotten from different stakeholders through the different channels we've had to, for people to weigh in, um, both during the, 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 the last public meeting and afterwards. And, and we've carried some of the concepts forward too. So Zoe's gonna go through all of this. I, th I think with medium efficiency, as I mentioned before. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I, I always strive for medium, you know? <laughs> um, so we're basically just coming off of the public meeting. We wanted to provide a little bit of like a debrief for you guys and also just, um, an opportunity to kind of discuss any um, any topics coming off of that that um, are sort of uh, top of mind. Um, so to kind of give you a sense of what we're going to go through, um, we'll just kind of like regroup on you know process and next steps, summarize some of the public input we got you know through the meeting, um, and then give you a heads up about the remaining public input um, opportunities so that you know what those things are and can share that with folks that you know. Um, and then we'll finish out with a couple of things that are kind of queuing off of a lot of the great feedback we've been getting throughout the planning process around sort of environmental policy um, and environmental issues, including resilience, um, and start to dig into some of the things that we're um, going to be looking into over the next um, two months, really, as we sort of work towards the next um, public meeting and towards the draft plan. Um, so, um, just as sort of a, a quick, you know, uh, review here. So we had the public meeting um, number one in sort of, you know, early mid January. Um, our next public meeting is in April. Um, we haven't set a date for that yet, but that's kind of what we're targeting um, with the intent that we're able to wrap this study up in time for it to sort of feed smoothly into the comprehensive rezoning work. Um, so these next, you know, the remainder of February and March are really important, like working months for us to get towards that sort of draft plan. Um, so we'll be con con collecting more input throughout that time, but we'll also be advancing some of the other things in the background. Um, so uh, the input that we've gotten so far um, as a first pass, um, I'm just going to walk through some of the Zoom poll um, results. So. I know you saw them kind of in the moment, but just so you have a little bit of more time to digest them. So the majority of folks um, that we heard from were within um, walking distance of the study area. So that's, you know, I think a good outcome that we, you know, we're hearing from folks who are most impacted by, um, by these changes. Uh, we also had a significant sort of recreational user group um, and a significant resident group that was beyond um, the study area. Uh, and then a pretty, you know, a decent representation from property and business owners, but not as much as we might have expected given sort of the feedback that we've gotten so far. So that's kind of something to, you know, consider going forward. Um, in terms of zip codes, similarly, you know, good news, basically, we heard from the zip codes that are kind of most tied in with our study area. That was sort of the majority of 30%, um, 28% of the folks who responded. Um, you know, we're, we're coming from the, the areas most impacted by um, this plan. Um, for the top issues, um, what we heard, the sort of the things that bubbled up to the top, sort of thinking about the study area as a whole, were the water dependent uses, um, jobs, uh, and then beautification, and then kind of coming in behind that public funding and development. Um, so an interesting spread there of, of kind of priorities or the top issues. In terms of the discussion groups, um, this, this feedback, there's sort of a lot there. So we'll kind of summarize this in greater detail as we're moving towards the final report, but we wanted to give you kind of a quick sense of the, the types of things that, that came up. Um, I know some you were each in your own discussion group, so you kind of have your piece of it. So in terms of the transition, so we had three prompts for people, right? We had the transition areas, um, wanting to understand if there's any kind of important places where they think we need to manage transition, tension, or conflict, um, any kind of things that they felt like we didn't cover in the land use scenarios, and then um, any sort of refinements of the development test fit. So in terms of transition areas, um, there's a desire to kind of encourage mixed use transitions or like buffers between districts, um, as well as broader pedestrian connect connectivity and beautification. 
um, and there was a general like uh, sort of observation about the negative impact that industrial spaces can have on sort of the quality maintenance upkeep of buildings, um, which is something that, you know, is, is not specific to Norwalk. It's a, something that people kind of, you know, talk about in a lot of different settings. Um, in terms of the land use scenarios, um, the main thing that came through that people wanted to talk about that we didn't really, you know, focus on as part of our previous meeting, which was intentional, was um, the uh, sort of environmental questions around connection to the water, um, contamination, um, public access, those sorts of things that we, you know, have talked about in, in other settings that wasn't kind of sort of the focus of the last public meeting. And then finally, in terms of the development test bits, um, the the main kind of feedback that we got was related to sight lines and visibility um sort of people reacting to the scale of the buildings that we were talking about um and this is sort of not news to anybody this is the same sort of reaction that um development in the area has received in the past so it's something that we're aware of and that we want to kind of be cognizant of but also kind of um you know push back on in a couple of places to kind of find the right balance um, the things, the other kind of things that cropped up is a couple of environmental considerations that we've been hearing about pretty consistently throughout the process. So ecological restoration, brown fields, um, flooding and water encroachment and water quality. Um, also a couple of mention of capital improvements and a couple of people kind of wanting to see a little bit of um, increased effort around engagement in, in particular of residents. Um, and so that's something that um, kind of in the next couple of slides, we'll just share with you some of the things that we've planned to try and boost that participation. We do feel like we've gotten a pretty good, um, you know, relative to some of the other efforts that are ongoing right now that we've been able to get a pretty strong um, participation on a topic that typically doesn't attract people by default. So land use is not typically something that people jump at the opportunity to participate on. So um, yeah, but it's, it's important to just recognize that that's something that people are wanted to see more of. So um, in terms of the land use scenarios, I'm just gonna, I have the slides sort of for reference in case we wanna dwell on any of them with further discussion, but um, basically I will just go through and share kind of what was, you know, where did we land with the Zoom poll results for each of them um, so that you can see kind of initial direction um, from public input, but um, there's, we're sort of still actively collecting input in a couple of other ways. So this is by no means kind of a final, um, final decision on any of these. So as a refresher, Marina District, sort of Washington Street Oyster Shell Park, industrial CBD transition, the East Bank um, sort of wrap around from the CBD and then the sort of mini industrial Marina District that's sort of nestled onto the highway. So for the broader Marina District, we had these um, four different scenarios, one, two, three, and four. And the one that you know, by far had the most interest was scenario four, which had um, sort of a residential um, wraparound here, mixed use um, artisan, uh, kind of along Water Street, mixed use artisan lining, um, sort of the street here, but then open space behind it. So that was the one that got the most interest. Um, the second was scenario two, which had a similar structure here, but had marine commercial in this pocket here. Oops, uh, let me go back for a second. Um, and in terms of um, public benefit priorities, um, water dependent uses was the thing that people most wanted to see prioritized for this district if we're gonna get any public benefit out of it. And then the next sort of step down, ecology and beautification. And feel free as I'm going through these, if there's anything that you're kind of reacting to or you wanna talk about, feel free to jump in. So a, a, a question mm -hmm. and that is, um, it, are you monitoring um, uh, the redevelopment agency study? Um, of the Harbor Loop? Yeah, and um, how, that, uh, how that might impact uh, the uh, priorities uh, that we're talking about here and um, um, how, uh, how, that, how that study may impact uh, this study. Yeah, absolutely. So we did have prior to the public meeting, we had a coordination meeting with um, the both the consultants um, that are supporting the redevelopment authority and the redevelopment authority staff that are most involved in the Harbor Loop um, sort of planning work. 
Um, and where we landed is basically that um, we are intending to incorporate, you know, our, our timelines are syncopated in a productive way and that they will be wrapping up their recommendations before we conclude, um, you know, our study. And so our intention is to fold their, you know, capital improvement, um, capital investment recommendations into our work and sort of coordinate that with how we're talking about um, the different districts. That being said, I mean, I think that their you know, public access and ecology and resiliency is sort of, all, there are some aspects of all of those things nestled into their planning work. And there may be some cases where, for instance, like here, um, you know, where there might be within the redevelopment authority, the top priority is sort of advancing, let's say improvements along Water Street to provide, um, you know, a better, you know, bicycling path along there. I don't know if that's the case, but just for, for example, um, and we may find that it, within the context of our study, the priority that we heard was, you know, you know, first we want to see investment in the water dependent commercial uses. So if and when there is some kind of tension there, that's something that we're going to have to, you know, have a conversation with the redevelopment authority and sort of reconcile those before we go to print. We don't want to sort of send conflicting plans out into the world. <laughs> so it'll, if there's if there's any sort of tension between the two, we'll definitely try and work through it um, directly with them and with this group. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for the next one, for the Washington Street Oyster Shell Park um, Waterfront District, this was a very subtle one. There wasn't a whole lot of change needed. So currently it's this sort of broad mixed use sort of customized design district. We presented two options, one that had sort of conventional mixed use and one that introduced mixed use artisan. Um, and the, uh, the preference was pretty clearly for the mixed use artisan, which would provide increased flexibility on the ground floor. Um, and here, the main priorities that came through were ecology and beautification, um, and then sort of a three-way tie between water dependent uses, jobs, and development. For industrial CBD, um, this one um, is currently, you know, almost exclusively zoned for heavy industrial with a little bit of um, CBD at the edge. And our proposals were really about um, sort of creating, managing the transition between that heavy industrial along the riverfront and um, the sort of inland CBD. Um, so this was the first, which was sort of more um, a little bit more industry friendly in terms of retaining maximum flexibility for those industrial uses. And then this one is a little bit more progressive in terms of buffering the residential and um, commercial uh, uses inland. Um, and the preference was pretty strongly for the one where you see a more um, sort of deliberate transition from heavy industry industrial uses towards um, lower impact uh, you know, zones that are more compatible with residential um, uses right adjacent to them. Um, and here, the, the main sort of public benefit interest was in ecology and jobs, and then coming off of that, um, an interest in uh, development and beautification. The next piece um, for the East Bank, um, kind of wrapping around from the CBD, this one, again, was a, a sort of somewhat simpler um, sort of set of questions. It was really about this sort of um, section in here. So the current zoning has sort of CBD wrapping around and then um, uh, conventional mixed use um, with increased design controls for the East Ave Village District. Um, and what we looked at was one scenario where we had the heavy industrial remaining sort of um, in the places where there's current um, you know, heavy in industry actively using those sites and having the rest remain mixed use artisan and the other sort of um, shows a, a mixed use artisan, you know, con continually through this in terms of the land use mix. Um, and there was a really overwhelming preference for um, uh, basically not continuing to have heavy industry industrial uses along the waterfront there. Um, this is of course, you know, not, not to say that we would remove the people who are there now, but it's sort of a, there was a clear preference that over the long term that people wanted to see this transition to um, sort of a use mix that was more compatible with pedestrian and bicycle and open space and e ecological um, benefits. Can I say one thing about this voting as I think about it, Zoe, mm -hmm. which is 
you know, in a way it's good to know generally which way people who were participating were leaning, but just the act of people thinking through these choices and having to make a choice um, is an important kind of educational step in letting you know, the larger group of stakeholders know what issues have to be balanced when you're thinking about land use. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think we should take the the votes as a kind of literal vote, but in a way we've communicated to the people that care about what the city's doing here, that there's a, a balance of issues that have to be considered. And so that's as important as the, as the, the actual numbers, I would say. We mm -hmm. shouldn't maybe overthink um, you know, to, to see some trends is helpful, but I, I think there's still it's still a kind of technical call that yeah. you know this the steering committee and the city has to make also just understanding other issues too. But it, it's just helpful to know more generally how people see the issues. Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, John looks like you have um, your hand raised. Yes, um, we we keep I keep hearing about uh, bike lanes. And I just wonder, is it a build it and they will come? Or how many bike users do we have in town? And are all these bike lanes ultimately safe at the end of the day? That's a great question. And something that, I mean, I think that there's, um, there's lots of different philosophies on sort of, you know, the role of bike infrastructure in encouraging, you know, you know, recreational and commuter use of bicycles um, versus also just providing for the patterns that exist already. I think in particular in Walk places where there's- yeah, not a conglomeration of different communities that were put together sometime years ago. Mm -hmm. East Norwalk, South Norwalk, Norwalk, Norwalk. So, I mean, we have separate areas. It's not like a, a town that was planned and can mm -hmm. ride a bike to here and there and right like yeah. individual villages almost right right that's, that's what I'm, that point yeah and i i don't you know it, it it's not you know because of our study area being fairly limited to you know from the nearest relatively major street to the to the water right it's it, it's an issue that skirts by our study area but isn't really central to it i mean I mean, John, just for, so that you know, um, we do a lot of industrial district studies. Right. And that's where sorting out bikes versus where trucks mm -hmm. that service businesses have to get really sorted out because then you get into safety issues and, you know. Um, yeah, I would think if we had a, 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 a river trail along the sound, ultimately, and that was broad right. enough that, that you could also put a bike lane in it. And they respected it. It's not more for exercise; it's just getting out, and viewing the water, and enjoying mm -hmm. what's going on. That may be more appropriate. But yeah. uh, I know there was a lot of stress because of the COVID tests, and they were being done in in Vets Park. And you know, under the the, the real heavy time and excitement that it was spreading real quick, they had from Vets Park in East Norwalk, they had cars lined up all the way down Water Street, which caused a lot of havoc mm -hmm. in that whole corridor. Yeah, I think that the, the water, water Street in particular, I think has um, a really complex, you know, set of circulation needs. Um, and so I think that uh, like, so this is the map that I'm showing here is, um, you know, it's not generated from this planning study, but it's sort of a, a broader, like an aspirational um, bike network for the sort of Norwalk as a whole. Um, and even sort of regionally looking at some of the, the sort of recreational connections. And so Water Street plays a role in that larger network to connect the dots between different sort of places. But I think that it, you know, the design of how that bike connection is made is really important because it is, you know, an active industrial commercial area. There's a real need for that circulation to remain efficient and safe. And so I think that 
balancing those things is, is definitely but, a but John's John's right. framing is an interesting one, Zoe, that we might highlight in future diagrams where this vision of the harbor loop being more or less at the water's edge works for 60% of the district in the future, but it doesn't work because of the marinas. So Water mm -hmm. Street becomes the de facto nearest thing to the water. And it doesn't work on the inner harbor on the west side because of the mm -hmm. industrial businesses that are down on the floodplain, right. right? So yeah, you can but, see the inland right. sort of alignment here for the same reason that you know right. it doesn't function at the water's edge on this side of the, the river. So we might we we might I'm just as to Gabriel and Zoe now and not to the steering committee. We might think about how we depict that issue graph. Again, it's not a lot of this is outside of our study area, mm -hmm. but to explain what happens in our study area, I think we need to be more explicit about how this this uh, uh, harbor trail locks into larger systems, and and it's it'll it'll be an ongoing discussion with the city planning staff about how that's all negotiated. But I, I would say generally, John, I agree. There's a there's never enough. Of a of real estate within the public right of way to do all of the things that everybody wants. <laughs> safely, that's the whole. Safely, thing. safely, exactly. That, that to me I is think, the key word: safety. I think um, John may have also been hearing. Um, our transportation department has been doing a lot more with um, bike lanes, and there have been a lot of requests in town for bike lanes. So it might be good for us to connect John and someone from transportation just to kind of hear more about the specifics of that, because I know we haven't, you know, talked about it a ton in this plan, but, um, but if he, John, if you have heard uh, about bike lanes, um, it might be coming from um, the transportation department and the um, bike walk commission, I think are really interested in them. Can I? Yeah, Galen, go ahead. I just want to say really briefly that just in my family, there are, is real, real interest in bike lanes. You know, it's a recreational uh, outlet. My granddaughter was searching all around for where were, were there bike lanes in Norwalk. Mm -hmm. She lives now in New Haven where there is a large, you know, safe bike lane, you know, bike trail. And that was really important to her. And she couldn't find that in Norwalk. I think there would be a lot of demand it's not just build them and they will come sort of abstractly. I think people are waiting right on the edge. Sort of yeah. for... You know, it's a big, you know, the economic development people in cities to attract people to, it's a, it's a branding and recruitment strategy. You know, the, 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 the bike lanes are not just about functionality, but to make Norwalk more attractive than town X because we've got, it's considered an amenity and something that can be sold to businesses that might want to relocate to Norwalk or people that want to live there. And th this is completely random, but it's a small group tonight. But, you know, I, I rode a bike in, in grad school and that was it. And I got back on a bike when I was 52 years old and I've been riding now for eight years and now I ride my bike everywhere. So, and it's not because it's not, it's not, it's because of the bike, the bike infrastructure between where I live and where I teach and where I work is a little bit better now than it was, so. Yeah, I think that's definitely like a, um, there's a couple of different ways that, you know, planning for bike and, you know, and pedestrian networks as well, you know, deliver a larger benefit to the city and to the sort of economic ecosystem and the, um, and the residential ecosystem as well. Um, so I think the, the, what we're sort of driving at here is, is trying to reconcile some of those bigger, you know, goals with some of the site specific, you know, constraints and challenges so that we can still kind of pursue some of those big picture opportunities, um, but not sort of disregard the, the very real conflicts that are present in a couple of the places and, and actually sort of treat those with respect and try and figure out how to balance them. Um, in a way that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about, about Water Street and it's all of its pressure on it, right? Is that, you know, are, are bicycles best sent back a block where there's yeah. zero conflicts 
you know, I always seek the parallel no street to the busy street when I ride my bike. And no flooding. And no flooding. Yeah, I think there's a, you know, maybe we can bring this up, you know, to the redevelopment authority a little bit and, and maybe talk to some of the, you know, transportation and, um, you know, other departments that have been working on this more closely, because I mean, I think there's the basic, the missing link is between sort of this, you know, parking lot here at the edge of Oyster Shell Park and sort of moving continually to this sort of bike route here and to the sort of um, what sort of is aligned with West Avenue here. So there's kind of a, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you could, you know, close that gap um, and Water Street is one of them, but not the only one. Um, but I'm sure there are trade-offs for all of these, like South Main is, you know, busier street in some ways. Um, so yeah. yeah, maybe something that we can, we can bring back to the, some of the internal discussions with other city folks and, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to harp on bikes at all, believe me. <laughs> no, it's I mean it's good. I mean, I think that it's also like a a bike, uh, a bike lane or a sharrow on its own doesn't make a safe environment. You know, you have to actually think about all the interactions that are happening on that road. So I think it's a it's a point well taken. I don't think that you no no apology needed. How about that? <laughs> you you brought it up in a thoughtful, non-confrontational way, John. So we appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the last, uh, just to jump back in here, um, the last uh, district that we did the scenarios on was this um, the sort of mini um, marina district that's sort of tucked right under the highway. Um, and for this one, we have kind of a, 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 a bit of a collection of different um, zoning you know, districts now. Um, and we presented, um, I believe it was four different scenarios. So this is kind of more or less as is. Um, you know, retaining some industrial, heavy industrial, but um, otherwise going towards light industrial, commercial, all light industrial, commercial, and then all heavy. Um, and the preference um, was for what I showed second, which was, you know, retaining um, a, a mixed use, heavy industrial um, use classification for this portion um, that are, is closer to the wastewater treatment um, facility, and then a more kind of light industrial lab uh, mix for the remaining portion. And that would still allow for, um, you know, marina and boat club uses, uh, but would also allow sort of a more expanded set of land uses than the Marine Commercial District currently um, focuses on. Um, so that was sort of the, the preference. There was also an interest in um, some of the other combinations as well. So that's, that's it for the scenarios. Um, any, any closing thoughts or, you know, ideas relative to the scenarios before we jump into some of the other um, feedback that we have planned. Just, I have a, a, a question for the group here, which is that there seem, there seem to be in our um, Marina District, let's say scenario, which had the idea that there would be a limited zone where you could do you know, mixed use development, maybe up to four stories in a certain dimension off of Water Street. But that would be contingent on the obligation to make improvements to the marina infrastructure. I, I, I got the sense generally that the public liked linking the, the ad adjustments to the land use regulations that, you know, you could only do that if there were certain commitments then to, you know, upgrading the dock infrastructure or adding a dock or making water dependent, um, you know, it would be a way to incentivize the market to make investments they might not otherwise. And I just didn't want to leave that lying here with this group. And if, if people heard the same thing and, and if they've reflected on that, what they think about that. Well, from a harbor management standpoint, you know, we're looking to increase the amount of dock space in Norwalk. Uh, we're working now with the city to uh, put in some transient docking and uh, with, through Dockwa and maybe expand Veterans Park. Uh, if we can get to have the wherewithal to put more docks on the east side of the, of the river, uh -huh. south of the bridge and south of the existing docks. So that would help take some of the pressure off because we're, we're sold out. I mean, there's waiting lists everywhere for, for dock spaces locally. And also in that same vein, 
you need the support systems, the repair shops, the marina stores to, to, to accommodate it. Now, uh, because the, some of the properties are underdeveloped there, they're renting out parking spaces to support some of the marina shops and, uh, and other businesses in that area. Uh, once they get developed, that all goes away. Yeah. And that's going to put a lot more stress on uh, off on, on, on street parking as well. John, we were thinking of making the, the right to develop on those properties would mean that you'd have to have marine, uh, marine uses on the ground floor. So in a way, it would incentivize the building out of new space. Um, we, we'd, we'd allow the ground floor, floor to floor height to be tall enough to accommodate those uses. It would, you know, in, in a way, the, the economics of what's upstairs could be the engine that drives building out new space, but the requirement would be that your tenants would have to be marine uses. Yeah, but then keep in mind also, there's a lot of uh, winter storage boats if you go by there and Mm -hmm. drive through the area there's a lot of docks that come out tackle for uh, moorings mm -hmm. uh, there, there's uh, facilitators there that uh, put in docks and, and repair docks you know th those kind of uses should be expanded upon and we had initially spoke in, in our one of our early meetings about incentiving the people to do more buildings and maybe lessen the parking requirements, which we kind of addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so also, I think so. And, and you know, I think the restricting the ground floor uses to, to marine, in, you know, marine uses could even be, some of that is open air and it's just used for storage on the ground floor too, because we, we'll, we're gonna get to this part of the presentation next, but, you know, by the way, there's a floodplain issue there. so. That's going to have to be like all of the marina areas, kind of floodable uses in the medium term, anyway. So, um, yeah. Did anybody read, or did you guys pick up on? There's a a big case going on now with new buildings where they eliminated dock space at Stanford, and those buildings are now collapsing, and they're a year old, two years old. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Collapsing <laughs> from flood damage or from other. No, just just uh, poor uh, foundations. Poor foundations. And if there's an article you can uh, a link you could send us, that would be helpful. I, I saw it on Facebook. I, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> we'll poke around and see if we find it on the internet. I'm sure if it's circulating, I'm sure we'll, we'll bump can I into ask it. one quick question? Yeah. Sure. Um, how do you define marine uses? Like my son-in-law, for instance, is on Water Street and has a wholesale fish business. You know, they get deliveries of fish, they, uh, they cut the fish, repackage it, deliver it to, you know, restaurants, country clubs, grocery stores all over the region. Uh, that was, when he started it, defined as a marine manufacturing use. Mm -hmm. Would that still be a marine use? How does, does he get the fish deliveries by truck or, or over the dock? By truck. Yeah, I mean, th this is a... The, the definition of marine use itself is something that, that I mean, we're not going to write the regs as part of this plan, but I, I, you know, marine use can be more expansive to include that, or it can be no, more narrow to say marine use is anything associated with boats that dock in Norwalk. And so the whole question about uh, fish processing being a marine use or not is a hot issue in Massachusetts, for example, because all of the fish processing in Gloucester, those, those fish come frozen from like Alaska and rail cars. So everyone's like, why do you have to be on the water then? Like you could be in an industrial park, you know. That, where... that is a very much, Pagano's is, is, is a city asset. I love that place. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a real challenge, right? Because it's something that's, it's contributing to the character of the district. Right. It's something that's consistent with the mission, Absolutely. you know. But their, their oysters come off of boats that are coming off the water right there. And some of, some of their lobsters as well. Yeah, yeah. Other, so other, yeah. other product has to be trucked in. But. Yeah, I, I would say, I would say that that would, I would recommend that that be, the, even if a piece of the business relies on over the dock activity, that would be included. But you don't want, uh, you know, 
developers and building owners uses a loophole to say, you know, we've got a goldfish store, right? Like the the, the definition of these uses is always, um, and again, that'll get worked out in, in a in a future phase, Steve and the team, when they actually start to draft the regs, but we can put some of those recommendations in the plan about yeah, but you know, up. that's certainly within the, that type of business there is certainly within the character mm -hmm. of, you know, the sea, right? Mm -hmm. you know, the, the yeah. sound and, and people enjoy going down there. Um, yeah, there's a retail store too. And yeah. people come down right. there. Wholesale and retail. Yeah. yeah, a couple of the folks in my breakout group mentioned it. And, you know, I think it's, it, I think it's, it, the shift in the economy has, made this particular issue like an issue of the moment where there's all of these businesses that truly actually have a hybrid model they they are you know rely on the road network as much as they rely on the sort of over the you know over the docks you know marine aspect of their business and so there's i think articulating a a vision you know within the context of this plan for for what that mix of uses is um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of uh, electronics people that could expand their businesses or bring new businesses in if they had a facility in Norwalk, mm -hmm. where people from other towns, other areas to drive business to Norwalk. Norwalk would be the go-to place to, to, to get work done on your boat because th those mm -hmm. places are drying up everywhere. Right. And, you know, the nature of our city and our waters and our shellfish industry and the like is conducive to having those types of uses there. Tim, when you were talking about the ground floor uses being um, a water dependent use, are you talking about the water word side of that would, or would that also apply on I the think, water street side? I, I think that based on our discovery that we've got a six foot gap between the existing elevation and the recent FEMA maps, you know, we might apply that to the whole, the whole ground floor of the building and not just the marina facing side. Um, I mean, again, we're open to allowing other retail there too, but I think, you know, thinking about our earlier discussions with the steering committee and the value, especially of residential units there on upper floors, which get this, you know, you know, if we can get, if we can get the, the parking ratios relaxed enough that the whole thing works, that's the issue a little bit, is that that maybe it makes most sense that, that re those residential uses cross subsidize reinvigorating, you know, the whole over the dock ecosystem that John and others have been talking about. Because um, I don't know if if retail, the like, traditional retail is ever going to make sense there anyway. I mean, I, I think that this we might frame the regs so that you can have accessory uh, retail to a wholesale operation, like the conversation we just had, or you could have uh, retail that serves a purpose relative to the marine econ the the marina economy that we're talking about. You know, um, that is supportive of, again, the kind of economic development vision that John's been painting. So now maybe Steve, you and your group will think that's a little bit too restrictive. And then maybe there's a, a, a percentage of the ground floor that has to be that, but a percentage that doesn't have to be. I mean, we've done all kinds of interesting things around getting that balance right. Um, but it's gotta be easy to communicate and enforce too, right? So the the regulations can't be so complicated that um, we'll just walk away. <laughs> that that, a, that a, 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 a development entity that's thinking of developing can't figure out the basic rules before they hire a whole engineering and design team to to tackle a site. So I don't know. I, I think that the the our discovery of the floodplain issues maybe made us tilt a little bit more to thinking more about, about marine industrial more expansively across the whole site, even with upper floor uses. Is that a fair assessment, Zoe? 
Yeah, I was just going to maybe suggest, so I, there's just a couple more slides that I have on the public feedback, and then I can jump into some, some slides that'll kind of support this discussion a little bit better. So okay. I'll just take a few moments to just, you know, coast okay. through these, and then we can get into some of this discussion with a bit more support. So um, we have uh, sort of before the public, the next public meeting, we have sort of a, like th basically three different ways that we're trying to gather some more input on the same things that we had you know, put forward in the, the last public meeting. So um, one is social pinpoint. So we have a new um, sort of version of it up that has a built-in survey for each of these, you know, five districts that we talked about. Um, and that launched on February 2nd. Um, our intention is to keep it open through the end of March. Um, and there's already been a fair amount of activity on it. So that's positive. You can, um, if there's anybody who wasn't able to make it to the meeting, or if there's somebody who's interested in providing input, but, you know, wasn't aware before, this is a great way to just sort of get a little bit more information from folks about their preferences and ideas. Um, we also um, developed a set of um, physical poster boards um, for use in at City Hall. Um, and we're also looking at some potential other kind of resident oriented locations to, to put up some of those so that we can um, hopefully grab the attention of some folks that might not have interacted with the plan yet. Um, so uh, the city team is looking at potentially putting it in the Carver Center, um, art space, and some of the public housing authority site um, common areas um, as a way to kind of um, boost our, in particular, our resident participation. Um, and then the last thing, um, not so visual, but uh, we are planning on March 22nd to basically do a rerun of the public meeting that's specifically marketed to the public housing residents in Norwalk, um, because there are several of the public housing sites that are right near our study area. Um, and there's a lot of sort of um, folks that we want to kind of, you know, reach out to and see if we can um, get some, some input from. So that's on the books and that's kind of it for what we have planned for engagement between now and the next public meeting um, and uh, so if there's anybody who reaches out to one of you looking for other ways to kind of get involved and provide feedback um, there's those are some different ways to kind of um, direct them and of course as always feel free to sort of encourage them to reach out to us directly um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of it. I've already mentioned this other stuff. So let's jump into um, some of the uh, zoning questions. So we, we had specifically um, sort of tabled some of these questions around resilience, habitat, and water quality so that we could sort of focus in on the land use questions first, um, in part because these are, are essentially an overlay, regardless of the base land use, these are still goals that are coming through loud and clear from you know what we're hearing from folks. So um, we kind of are, are focusing on them now that we've kind of had that, you know, frame some of those initial questions around land use. So um, these issues are, you know, what we talked about, flood risk, stormwater management and water quality, ecological um, questions, uh, things, questions about dredging and um, questions about brownfields and contamination. So these are things that sort of apply independent of land use and are things that the zoning kind of has some ability to um, shape or respond to, um, but also that um, some of them require really like capital investment and you know projects to tackle them more so than just zoning or regulations. So um, some of the capital projects things that came up, there's uh, you know an opportunity to maybe do a follow-up resilience study of the water street marine commercial um, so it's something that the city's already been kind of working on in the background that um, could help to give a little bit more specificity to um, you know infrastructure projects that might help the district as a whole um, and then there's a couple of other things that have come up through the engagement so far so um, interest in sort of restoration of marshland um, around portions of south veterans um, south of veterans park um, ideas about the same, the same general principle around the other public assets, such as the wastewater treatment plant and the Oyster Shell Park. Um, and then there was a couple of folks have mentioned the idea that they it might be valuable to try and purchase the ONG property um, on the east bank of the waterfront as a sort of a potential um, you know, public, uh, public recreation and ecological um, asset for the city. Um, it would be a pretty big item to pursue, but something that's come up. So we wanted to kind of share it here. Um, 
And then for all of the publicly owned properties, looking at um, ways to increase the sort of um, permeable, uh, you know, surface area versus impermeable to sort of contribute positively towards water quality. Yeah, and to be clear, the the plan, this planning effort is not going to dive into any of these, but include these as a, you know, th this is a, a a list of potential next steps that would be mm -hmm. part of the planning document. Um, yeah, it's really just to capture, you know, ideas that came out through this process so that they're available for follow-up in future efforts. Yeah, and, and people can refer to the, you know, adv advocates can say, well, on the, on the, in the waterfront plan, this was mentioned, you know, we think the city should not to put the city on the spot, but it's helpful to have these lists and plans so that they can be picked up in the future as as funding becomes available and stakeholders get organized. Tim, Tim and Zoe, uh, excuse my ignorance, but what is a sponge park? Yeah, we I, Zoe, we should just call it a public park. There, there's going to be no <laughs> sponge when we're capping an a industrial site. Yeah, a, a sponge, a sponge park. It's you know, you don't hear it very often, but it's a it's a park that that deals with on site stormwater management or even stormwater management of a of a nearby neighborhood. It it serves a kind of maybe maybe you've heard of the expression rain garden, but rain mm -hmm. garden at the scale of a park. And so it can reduce outflows into the harbor, but industrial sites are hard to re-engineer yeah. to function that way. Yeah, this might be a case where we want to re reskin the idea as it came from <laughs> the engagement and make it a little bit more uh, yeah, realistic. Yeah, this also came directly out of a comment too. Yeah, um, we should, probably should have it in quotes if we're going to include it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so we don't, we're not we're not proposing a sponge uh, harvesting area to, yeah. to complement the oysters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and change the name to Rain Guard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and then there's some more basic, just sort of zoning standards and incentives that can help to facilitate the same things that you know individual projects also pursue. So, with all of that, now we can dive into some of the specifics that we're already kind of starting to get into for the marine commercial um, test fit revision. So, we already talked a little bit about the um, sort of public access network. So that you know inserts some questions about Water Street. Um, and then we also did do kind of our homework on um, looking up the, the flood elevation differential. And um, I think this is something that um, some folks on this committee were already kind of raising to us, but now that we've got the actual dimensions in hand, we understand the severity of the problem here, which is that we basically have us, you know, the highest point on a lot of the parcels that are, you know, along this water street, um, the water side of water street, their highest elevation is about six or seven feet above um, sea level. And um, the base flood elevation for this area is 12 feet. So that's about a, you know, depending on where you are, it's a six foot differential. Um, so that's a, that's a big um, difference to be handling, um, you know, just through urban design tools. So that's, it's, it's sort of a, um, it's, it basically triggers a different set of questions around how, how do we really manage flood if, if we're talking about a flood of that depth. Did you have a conversation? We had discussed it that you were going to follow up with it with Deep to get a read on mm -hmm. what what they would like to see or what they would allow and not allow. Because I know, like the the property that um, the state acquired on Water Street, yeah, it's over here from, from Spinnaker, uh, and condemned it. That property, they applied to put a bulkhead in several years back, and deep denied it. For yeah, yeah, I think I think the problem with those per property solutions is it pushes floodwaters to adjacent properties, and so I think our thinking was to, you know, understand what. The minimum design flood elevation would be, which is this one. I mean, if we get into climate change and global warming and you know, 2070 projections, it's going to be higher than this. But to 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 be relatively conservative about this, run through the issues, see what the best practice solutions would be, um, and then loop around to state stakeholders to get their opinion about this. I think that's our. Yeah, but now it, you keep in mind that if you're storing docks and tackle for moorings and 
and boats, which are absolutely needed. Also having the necessary parking for what would be going on over there um, and not have those parking spots flood out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's certainly, it's a complex puzzle. So I mean, I think that we can kind of walk you through like some of the, um, some of the opportunities that we see to kind of, you know, and basically create the economic engine that we have in mind, right? Which is sort of introducing a new development opportunity that can help to drive reinvestment into the marine commercial and into the sort of the kinds of infrastructure that could protect those businesses um, without, you know, putting something on the table that's infeasible, right? Or that's not sort of um, a responsible solution to, you know, a very serious flood risk. So I think that the intent here of what we've kind of started to test out is um, coming up with a mix of uses that is tolerant of flooding, that is, you know, designed and built with that flood condition in mind. Um, and that, you know, during a flood event might be not operational for a period of time, but would be able to resume operations with minimal damages um, and continue to contribute positively to the district in all that time when the, there isn't floodwaters in their building. Yeah, I mean, thinking about it another way, in a way, the, the flood risk is the, the flood elevation delta between the average grade there and the design elevation is, is a bigger delta than we thought it was gonna be. Um, and in a way, the marinas might, as a result, be the highest and best use along that edge. Yeah, they because have a really the, a good yeah. reason to be there. <laughs> I think for right. most other uses, you know, without the specific reason why they need to be in this location, the flooding alone is reason enough to not, you know, to not build. Um, right. So I think that you know, really getting serious about how we're tying our development strategy to that, you know, both that character and also that economy um, is what ultimately would make this development a realistic outcome. Um, so why don't I, I'll, I'll jump into, um, you know, one of the things that we looked at a little bit more closely is, um, you know, the resilient strategies that were incorporated into the new development sort of clustered around the intersection of Raymond and Day. Right, so this is, um, you know, there was the, you know, federal um, funding went in to support the, the rebuilding of Soundview Landing um, apartments. That was, you know, in terms of your questions, John, about like how, you know, how state and federal agencies are interacting with building in a flood zone. I think that this sort of demonstrates that when, when the strategies are sound, they're open to that kind of development, but it has to be addressed in like a really deliberate and meaningful way at the beginning, because otherwise this is not a responsible place to build. Um, so this, the solution sets here were really about an elevated ground floor and an elevated intersection here that provided safe access and egress for those developments. Um, so you can see this is that, that elevated intersection. You can see that you know, the entrances are guided at this highest point and then it sort of slopes down towards Water Street. Um, so this is, you know, something that they had enough space to sort of make that topo topographic manipulation because they were controlling all of that land at the same time, right? Um, that's not gonna be the most likely scenario for along Water Street. It's more likely to happen in a piecemeal fashion. And so that kind of unified solution um, is a little bit uh, of a stretch goal, um, but it's something that's, you know, it's helpful to see the strategies that were implemented in those nearby developments as a precedent for kind of what, what that, um, what those strategies could look like and what, which ones can be transferred to our sites. And what Zoe means about that is that, you know, that they're using a whole block to get up to the high point. Mm -hmm. And, but this solution left South Water at its current grade. And so it, it, which means that, that for those two blocks, South Water is kind of, for the medium to long-term, <clears throat> needs to live at that grade where it is. You can't get up high enough and then back down again between the water sheet, the middle of the marina blocks and back to Water Street to keep the floodwaters from coming over the top of that and flooding the gap in between. That's the problem in a nutshell. Well, but Zoe has a, has a cross-section diagram to show this. 
yeah maybe just before we jump into tammy do you have um uh, yeah just a question or comment i think your aerial photo um is showing it's very old because in that block two sound yeah. view landing apartments yes. i mean you're seeing the old apartments that were there and there were actually a lot of trees and stuff so i just want to make sure that you don't think you're looking at a a nice leafy treed area i mean that's a massive yeah building it's out. fully built out yeah. yeah there's no new aerial yet that's, so we've been looking okay. yeah that's uh, apologies it is it is very out of date um the you can see the streetscapes have kind of been improved in this photo so this was taken during construction um, why don't we make those those covers just fill of a color zoe so you're not seeing the old stuff below. yeah we can do that yeah there's no green there it's just yeah, a diagram it's yeah really bad it's bad trees anyway okay thank you no i appreciate that and that's a good point also that you know even though these were you know within their sites they were handling the flood um you know the flood risk for those buildings they may have also been you know not absorbing the amount of storm water that maybe they were absorbing before so it's there's a bit of a push pull there um so this is sort of the same diagram that we had sort of shared before about sort of general like you know design principles when we're talking about the green infrastructure so things along water street thinking about these sort of sight lines through to the water and then opportunities along the water's edge um, just as a refresher, kind of these are the, the development test fits that we were thinking about. And so what we're really looking at is sort of tweaks to these that might um, sort of increase their, their resilience, increase their ability to handle stormwater, um, you know, create a more uh, vibrant sort of public realm along Water Street. So it's sort of these sort of tweaks around the edges that we're looking at. So this is the section that um, Tim was referring to. So you can kind of see here, um, at Day Street, we have kind of a high point. It drops down towards Water Street, um, and I'll, I'll use this on the sort. So this is the existing condition on the top. So from Day Street, Day Street dropping down to Water Street, and then kind of there's fluctuations that are different for each parcel about you know the, the topography from Water Street to um, you know to the ocean, you know to the bay. Um, that you know basically you know there's little fluctuations up and down, but basically it's, it's sort of flat and sloping down towards the water um, from Water Street, um, you know, across. So we, we kind of have this, this um, opportunity uh, along Water Street to sort of define a sort of entryway sequence that is perhaps sensitive to the sort of flood differential. Um, and also we have sort of the question of, you know, if this is, you know, a six foot differential, basically, you know, how do we think about the design of the ground floor um, of these buildings to be compatible with flooding? Um, and so there's a, a bunch of kind of operational and construction options to design for what's called wet flood proofing, which is assuming that floodwaters will enter the building and that you are designing for that to occur and to designing for the building to be healthy, safe, operational, um, you know, soon thereafter um, with minimal damages and um, that, you know, in the interim, it functions as a normal building, you know, without much disruption. And those requirements include, um, uh, you know, the construction, the construction of the first floor from a construction systems and material standpoint requiring um, mechanical systems and transformers to be above elevation X of, you know, back to the discussion of the uses that you allow on the ground floor. And so these more robust marine uses, which are already happening in the floodplain are a better fit than a fancy, you know, shop that has an expensive tent fit out in terms of slightly raw space there. So this is um, gives you a, a little bit of a feel for what that those kind of ratios look like. Um, so the main opportunities that we're kind of queuing in on is, you know, how do we how do we guide people on the entryway sequence off of Water Street? How do we guide people on um, the sort of the dimensional standards and the build out of the ground floor space, including the uses that go there? Um, and then, you know, how do we uh, how do we um, create a you know a nice entryway up to the upper floors that's a safe entryway for folks that are um, either residential or office tenants that are in the upper floors and the other well i'll circle back to this later but there's also kind of other um you know not flood related uh 
improvements that can be considered throughout the sites to increase their stormwater absorption and also along the water's edge that can have a similar um, kind of beneficial effect. Um, so these are some of the, um, just to give you a little bit of a visual when we're talking about these things, um, on the left, you can see an example of, um, you know, a sort of an a intentionally designed entryway sequence that gets people up to an elevated ground floor. Um, and this is a way that you can, you know, protect those entrances um, and create kind of a an elevated ground floor space um, that's protected. Um, it does require setting the building back a little bit more to give enough space to negotiate that grade change with, um, you know, accessible ramps that are at, you know, a, a the appropriate grade. So it does require a little bit more, you know, creating a little bit more space, um, but that might deliver some other kind of co-benefits for Water Street as well. If we look at sort of increasing that setback a little bit and making room for something like this, it could kind of do double duty in a couple of ways. Um, the other way to sort of negotiate that grade changes is inside of the building. So to sort of allow that entryway to be a floodable entryway, and then you have an elevated ground, um, ground plane that sort of picks up to the infrastructure, for instance, elevators going to the upper floors or stairs. Just to fill out the vision of this, the idea might be that the, the marine industrial uses or the marine uses that face the marina side of the building might be coplanar with the tarmac of the marina operations and be floodable as much as anything else that is part of the operation. And this is medium term, not long term solutions for solving flooding, you know. And, but you might raise up. Um, maybe the retail portion of a, re of a retail wholesale hybrid use, um, but certainly also you would raise up the lobby for the uses on the upper floors. And again, the, the choice is, do you do that out in the landscape or you could even do it as part of the interior? So th those are all choices maybe that developers could make, but they would be required to make the choice with intentionality somehow. We would set the rule set, but allow some flexibility for different developers partnering with the marina owner to figure out what the best solution would be. Yeah, I still don't get how you tie in apartments with marine use. It, yeah, it, ima yeah Im imagine, John. Uh, no, a I, know, I, you know, yeah. I get it. It's all yeah. building. You have the marine use on the bottom, but it doesn't facilitate with the amount of both that need dry storage for the off season with all the repair works and shops that need to facilitate it. You're gonna lose all of those. And the docks that have to come out by law every, uh, every uh, winter and be placed on dry land. Well, so you're really talking about the it's, staging it's, area. You're not right? gonna have it. Yeah. It's, well, it's no, a no, that's a whole corridor. I mean, yeah, it's it's Sorry, a question, not the, not John. The, not of, the parcel, the stationary parcel. I'm meaning like that. You you're talking about the you know the paved area that's used for storage of boats, and that is that you're worried about the footprint of this development constraining correct. that area. And all the docks. I mean, there's going to be more, more, hopefully more of it. Right. If we if we build it right, there could be buildings that are put in Butler type buildings that. They wind up with indoor storage as well. And yeah. I'm sure there's a need for it. It's just that you have to, like we talked about, the incentive, get these properties developed. I mean, it, it doesn't do the town any good to have underdeveloped properties either. But yeah. I, I'm not but John, sure. couldn't some of those functions that are in those single, I mean, some of those Butler buildings are tall because they have to accommodate right. taller things. But some of them are, are shorter for kind of more normal storage, a lot of that stuff could be the stuff that happens on the ground floor of these buildings, you know? Yeah, but, you know, you're, you, you keep incorporating apartments into the equation on the upper floors. And, it, it, you know, even right, you, you're going to mix docks and, 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 and tackle and, uh, and, and boats for dry stores and facilitate parking for other businesses that already exist on the west side of uh, Water Street. So I think part of what um, the sort of 
the, as a baseline, the assumption would be that, you know, the marine commercial uses are staying. And so the people who are choosing to live in these places are choosing to live with that environment, right? That is, that is part of the agreement. That's part of the attraction even. Um, and I think in terms of the parking needs, I mean, the, the, in order for this to work spatially and economically, the, the residential development would need to have a much sort of a, a reduced parking requirement um, to sort of, to make sure that it wasn't expanding beyond the footprint of the building. Um, so all of the schemes that we're looking at are basically containing that parking within the footprint of the building. Or there's um, shared parking that, you know, that, that is used by the residents in the evening and used for the marina business mm -hmm. operations during the day. Like that, that level of, I, I think it, you're right, John, in a way, because through a special permit, you can do a lot of the things we're showing. And, and yeah, but in a, in, in a very much limited way. Right. You know, you can, instead of 100 units or 120 units, you can put 12 to 18 units. Right. So, I mean, it, 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 it is a different dynamic altogether, which still leaves you enough of a footprint to facilitate these other things as well. Yeah, I, I, Zoe. If you go back to the the overall views of the development sitting on kind of the medium length marina, you know that that two hundred and forty two feet, which is a little bit of a random number, but we we started with the parking and we reverse engineered it, John. That 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 par parking field that's partly under the buildings and partly sticks out a little bit is right sized for the amount of floors we're showing on the floors above. Everything else, and that could be shared by the way, that could be parking that is, you know, 100% residential in the evening, but shared 50-50 with the business uses, um, you know, either in the ground floor or out front. And the, the rest of that site is all. I don't know how you're gonna handle, I mean, these elevated, and, and they have it on, if you go, uh, North on Water Street, mm -hmm. the other side of the Strapolino Bridge, some some of the places there, the stores are elevated, such as one of your illustrations. Yep. But they're continuous buildings that don't stop. You're going to need exit and entry into all these different properties. And isn't that water going to go into those properties? And 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 uh, where, where does that water go? Well, it, it goes and then it recedes, but because the, the lobby and the mechanical systems are elevated, you know, that that's, you know, that's a bigger, a, a, a bigger inflection point for the city, which is, you know, do we set up some rules so that the market responds and solves the solution the way the big development did across the street? but on a building by building basis. And I also think that any kind of retail establishment here is gonna be accessory to wholesale operations anyway. So I don't think we're envisioning this as a, as a kind of shopping street, like, um, you know, like Washington, like Washington street, street yeah. right? It's it, it, in, um, somebody made a comment earlier about um, the wholesale fish company has a retail operation. I, I think that might be more the kinds of things we, see along here a kind of episodic kind of yeah. shops that are associated with the businesses that are associated here yeah bob bob uh Kunkel got on our call last time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's got the uh the marine highway grants and he's right. got, got the electric boat he would love to have a facility in that area that I, mean, he could I think that's exactly i think that this is i i guess to step back for a second i think the, the flood risk that you're describing and the impact on the businesses exists today, right? Like those businesses are all dealing with those sort of that nuisance flooding. They're all dealing with the impact on their operations already, right? And, but my, they- My thought would be to build them all new facilities. So I think that that's what we see this upon as- on that use. Yeah. But, but how think, is that going to, how's that going to get facilitated? How do, I mean, this, this is the same kind of conversation we have anytime we undertake a, a considerable uh, rezoning effort or 
who, who's paying for this and why are they going to pay for it? What's the incentive for somebody to do something different than what's occurring right now? I, I think what we're talking about is providing financial incentive to reinvest in the property with the priority being water dependent uses as you've indicated in, in you know, as, as you've articulated. We want to maintain those uses, but there's got to be a financial benefit for somebody to go ahead and do so. Yeah, but Steve, all roads seem to, in, to, to lead to apartments in Norwalk as an investment and a, and a return on investment. And I get that, but these are pre-existing zones that need to but, be honored for the long term. But John, they already allow apartments in these zones. We're not talking about but doing something limited, that's already permitted. Very limited, Steve. Not, not to the degree that potentially that they'll, they'll be looking to develop them. I, I would disagree just because what, you know, if you look at the picture on the screen, that's limiting the area where that kind of activity can occur. So it's not like they can take the entire footprint of the site and build one big massive development like you might see across the street. It's going to be, you know, contracted and kept yeah, those, to the are, those are, those, those are, um, they're, they're three, three stories over one of marine use not you know five like across the street and we we've considered you know at least the framework for the rules to encourage commercial on the upper floors as much as residential and, and the but if you're going to play the cross subsidy game from private from private development to pay for the kinds of improvements you've you've in any market cycle you've got to meet the market where it wants to do things or there's no investment. <laughs> you know, it's, um, you know, if this was the Johnson administration, John, we could, you know, take all this property and get a big federal grant and do it all. But we've got, you know, it's um, the only way the you federal, can get Federal anything. grants are a little more anemic these days. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the only way to affect change is to leverage capital markets and what they want to do anyway. I also think, by the way, that doing upper floor commercial space over the marina for the kinds of businesses that you find in Fairfield County, the big direct marketing firms and, you know, small bespoke financial companies. It's also a pretty sweet spot to have a, some office space too, um, with all of the hustle and bustle of the marina as well. There's a, there's a market for living in these kinds of districts that there wasn't really 15 years ago. Um, because for all the reasons that, that we all like that activity and the kind of seasonal change and all of that. So, I mean, only, only the market will, will determine whether um, we get the recipe right. Um, often, um, you know, the market doesn't respond, but there's been market interest in these properties and, and um, a, a, not a clear path forward about how to do anything. So I, I think sending a clear message to the market and the landowners because I think also I suspect that some of the landowners are sitting on their property waiting to see when payday is going to happen, when they think they can fully develop the sites. And so I think providing clarity to the landowners that, yeah, you can redevelopment, but, but these are the rules within you can, might get stuff to happen on some of those properties that aren't being used uh, to their full potential for water dependent uses too those recalcitrant owners who are kind of waiting to see. I wonder, John, if maybe a helpful next step might be to speak with, um, I don't know if this is what, something that you want to take on or um, something that maybe we can help with is, uh, you know, these are obviously, these are out in the public now, we shared them in the context of the public meeting um, for active, you know, marine commercial businesses on these sites, you know, for them to flag for us if there's anything that they think is going to genuinely constrain their operational abilities, you know, that we can understand and make adjustments, right? With same, the same end goal in mind of like creating a development engine that can help drive investment, right, for them. I, um, I, know, I know our meetings are, and the public gets invited. There's, and, and someone brought it up the last uh, meeting uh, about, the discouragement from people to get on these calls and get involved because 
and I'm not saying it's a, that this is the case, but the feeling is, the impression is that it's just an exercise in futility because there's a fait complete to what what the, what some people want and they're gonna get it. And this is just a process to bring us down the garden path to get there. So there, there's a lot of that, but if you if you talk to in depth, and I know, and I and I know you you guys have to a degree, and or have a a, a quasi meeting with all the people that are actually in that zone now doing business there, and see what their real thoughts are. Now they're not the property owners, and I get that, but they're the end users that are facilitating a lot of people in the Norwalk community. All the people that because the boat clubs don't do repairs or uh, mm -hmm. not not always enough storage uh, on their existing facilities. And there is definitely a need. Now, granted, there's no question about the, these properties need further development. Mm -hmm. And we yeah, got to so we got to knock down that wall, right? Yeah, yeah, this is hopefully this is our ticket to get that ugly wall down. <laughs> um, so I think I think I guess the what I want you to, uh, you know, walk away with or, you know, take away that like, we're serious about wanting this to support the marine commercial uses. And so if there's something that you think is, you know, something specific that we can make adjustments to that will make this a better recommendation for how but to the other is, is that is good. The, the other thing is benign neglect. We don't change the zoning. The status quo is the answer here. And I think- No, I don't risk, think that's the answer. I, 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 I think the risk with that is that, um, you know, redevelopment decisions get happened in the political arena too. Mm -hmm. And without a nuclear set of rules that keep that from happening, you know, projects happen anyway. And, and Norwalk, Norwalk is, you know, I, I, knowing Norwalk well for, you know, 50 years of my life, it, it happens occasionally, right? So I think the, to have a, a, a thoughtful, balanced proposal that gets out ahead of the market through other strategies getting what it wants is, is an important consideration for this area in particular it's like you know it's a very attractive location here and i you know there's been development proposals in the recent past right yeah um, uh, well if you plug in an incentive for adding dock space not only for the people in the apartments oh yeah for the public at large i think we'd be public i would be marinas that yeah we'd, i think that's what we have in mind here yeah, there's, I think there's, we can probably list out a couple of, you know, different, you know, types of reinvestment into marine commercial use, but that at the very least that as a contingency, you know, that you, or that, that your ability to pursue this kind of redevelopment would be contingent on demonstrating the ways in which you're going to invest. In yeah, but I wouldn't want to see us come to the, to the end of this road and have deep, walk all over it later as these applications. No, fair enough. I think that we need to make sure there aren't state regulatory issues that are gonna run afoul of what we're pro proposing here. Yeah. Hey, um, just to confirm, um, we have spoken with Deep a few times about this project. Um, and so they're aware and we keep updating them as um, anything else is to add. We just, since we don't have any, um, we shared our ideas with them so far, but since we don't have any um, specific recommendations, they've only shared with us um, their documents about what is allowed and what's not allowed. And that's been shared with the consultant team. Um, and that's been shared with the consultant team. And as a result, um, Zoe and Tim have been incorporating um, deep uh, requirements into the plans and nothing proposed so far um, is not aligned with what they would allow in this area. Yeah, I think I think what what maybe John's reference is when we get into the the uses that would then allow for the unlocking of these development rights. That that's when we would circle back again. Um, but but yeah, Laura's right. We have at a, a kind of higher level, John um, uh, had that in our our wheelhouse in terms of considering it. So Zoe, just in the interest of time, yep. We're uh, just about 
We're just about yeah. done here. So I think um, I can just briefly mention, you know, some basic like stormwater, you know, management features that could be incorporated and then also some, you know, solutions for, um, you know, having active um, dockage space um, that is connected back to the shoreline, but that allows for sort of ecological restoration in select areas that are not, you know, necessary for the, the core operation. So this is something that we can kind of, you know, incorporate into the development guidelines as well as a, a form of incentivizing things that improve water quality, improve resiliency, um, but retain the core operational function of, of the, the businesses. And so sorry to interrupt Zoe, but could we yeah. just go back to this, um, you know, along the south uh, side of, well, the east side of Water Street. Um, most of the people that answered the surveys liked the idea of either recreational, ecological, um, mm -hmm. marine access. I don't think there was anything that either noted or said that they want more residential development. And I'm thinking if you tie that in with the deep, if the city said, okay, no, no residential on that side of Water Street, and I know we're trying to get away from specifically like having too many zones because um, we're redoing the, the zoning map and another study with you guys. So mm -hmm. if you take away that incentive, and we all know that the easiest thing for developers to do is just throw up apartment buildings, but if you make it more creative and make it truly marine dependent use and okay, maybe some workspace above on the higher floors, then you don't have people living there. You're kind of mitigating the flood impact because most people that are impacted by flooding, you know, are residents as opposed to people that come and go every day, commuters, workers, and whatnot. Is there any value in trying to create some type of a you could, special again, zone it's, there? It's back to Steve's question, which is- Yeah, how do you make the, it the, happen? The, private market market the private real estate market has to respond to the rules the city doesn't build these buildings and i right i i, I you know I, I think that a build to suit small office building um for a particular well-resourced company that would think it would be cool to be located here um is a possibility in this fra zoning framework. I think if we only allowed, um, if you point yet to the to the blue version, that's the blue version. Um, but I think if you only allowed this, um, the the number of landowners slash developers that would come forward to want to invest in the properties and then do all of the other things that we want the cross subsidy to do would take much longer and might not happen at all. So again, the development, I mean, one could argue too that the development itself has value as to the housing supply, which, you know, I think these would be a different kind of unit on the market than other you know, units that would add to the diversity of the city and all Fairfield County has a kind of housing supply problem. So there might be other people on Steve's team who would see the benefits of, uh, it's, it's, it's within a walk of the commuter rail, like all of the thing, Metro North, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I see your point too, but you know, you, know, you, might, you might get one developer in, in five years to do one of these and then all of, or those incentives might not, except for a, a very particular kind of tenant developer the incentives might be, be seen as too much of a burden as a cost for doing this. So that it's more likely that you'll get the market to respond with housing to add the docks and add infrastructure or whatever we're gonna have on the wish list of what you have to do. Um, but well, yes, in an ideal world, it, you know, it, it might be better just to have commercial on the upper floors and not mm -hmm. residential there. It's not my opinion. I, I like the mixed use nature of of cities, but I, I think it's a strong argument. I guess my fear is that Norwalk will just cave and we'll just end up with apartment buildings there and we will effectively lose a lot of the marine stuff and you can't 
put it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So anyway. No, I think I think it's a good comment. I mean, Steve, what what I mean, what's your broader comment about about the role that private investment plays in making this all happen? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I think it's it's if done correctly, you get improvement. I think otherwise you get status quo. I think I don't think we started out on this to do status quo. I think it was identified as an area that was underperforming. And there's there could be improvements that are, I don't think, impact the water dependent uses at all. I, I think everybody that's participated in this from the, the city side, uh, you know, on the committee side as well has said, you know, we understand that the, you know, primary function of this area is marine dependent uses. We, we've heard an infinitum that that's what deep wants. We understand that fully um, and the implications involved with everything that surrounds that. Um, I think that the idea to get something on the site that complements Water Street and then can subsidize further investment in these properties, to me just seems like a pretty simple solution to some of these problems. What the exact um, nuance of the formula is, is what, what we have to work out at the end. But I, I mean, I don't know why we, you know, why what's there now, particularly given that I would say a big chunk of the property owners isn't what they want there. But, you know, and I get the fact that if you just loosened up the zoning completely, that a lot of those uses would completely disappear. And I don't think that's what we want. No one's saying or advocating for that. I think we're trying to come up with a solution that um, you know fits all needs. Yeah, so I guess to on that note, I think that we've I think really appreciated the the ways in which you know each of you I think are flagging some of the issues that you know for the for this area in particular, you know, where we need to anticipate these conflicts or these tensions between those uses so that we can come up with something that that might actually kind of provide a path forward that supports the existing use in the ways that needs to be supported to you know get you know make it through this next cycle of you know resiliency demands infrastructure demands um, sort of investment demands um, yeah so I, I, I think there's a, there's a you know I think there's a lot of there's there's more at stake in the zone than other places in the plan, you know, because, you know, the in the in, in upper harbor, the industrial uses um, on the west side aren't going anywhere for a while on the east side, there's one or two holdout industrial businesses, but it's clear where the market's headed there, I think this is important for Norwalk to get right. And I, I worry that with stasis, the big shiny project gets dr dropped here, you know, that doesn't balance the uses and you get a weird enclave here in the middle of run of the marinas that um, seems like it was dropped from outer space. And, uh, and I think to develop a set of guidelines so that as each development happens, it adds up to something too, right? Where there's a there's a logical frontage, the heights are kind of consistent, the, the uses that are prescribed for the water street side have some coherence from one building to the next. Um, but, you know, developers are, are looking for, for sites like this in Fairfield County on the water, I promise you. And uh, I think to, um, and I, maybe the balance isn't quite right, or maybe we need to make sure that the, the zoning has level of prescriptions that are a little bit more amped up than they are in other parts of Norwalk to make sure that how the compatibility of the uses are managed is built into maybe not the zoning itself, but a parallel set of design standards that the planning board uses, for example. But um, I think uh, Galen, I think you have to go, right? I have to go. I'm so yeah. when, no, it's okay. I'm just antsy now. I know. I appreciate I think appreciate your time. I know we, we've we've already gone over our, our hour and a half mark after promising to be medium level of content. So okay, well, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Um, I, sorry, Tim, you just said something really 
important that you know developers are really looking for this type of um, land waterfront you know has areas that are run down and in need of redevelopment but what what kind of developers are they well the kind if you can is marine just look dependent at use or are they just you know Avalon but it, I think world. what we're trying to design is something that regardless of what the developers coming in, like whatever they want, there are a set of guidelines in place that are saying this, these are the rules of the road if you want to develop here. Right. So, you know, you, you have to either agree to this or you have to find another site that doesn't have the same. I think the, the example is Stanford, right? Um, yeah. And they, they were too permissive about how they let those areas get redeveloped. Um, yeah, and they have no marine use down there. You're talking exactly. about the South End, right? And I, I don't, we don't want that to happen to Norwalk. That's I right. So you can only, so I, I we're saying you can only, on the board, but. if you don't have marine uses on the entire ground plane and you, and you don't, and you only build 240 feet from the back of sidewalk of Water Street, then we'll talk to you about a project and you, and you don't build any higher than four stores. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and then there's uh, beyond the zoning, there's a set of design guidelines that, that are going to be the rule set that the, plan, the, the planning staff and the planning board uses to evaluate your project. Mm -hmm. That's how you keep Stanford from happening. I think it's, I, I would see it as sort of an accountability tool, right? Like whatever we're, we're designing into this zoning is a tool to make sure that any developer um, or property owner that wants to pursue you know, a, a redevelopment of a site in this area, they have to, you know, make accommodations and invest in the way that, you know, this, this group and the city has sort of laid out and that if they're not willing to do that, then that development doesn't occur, you know, and the, the current status remains until there's a, a developer or property owner that is is sort of engaged enough and committed enough to actually pursue that mix of uses that we're looking for. All right. Another, it, it's minor, but it's actually really major in all of the Norwalk Harbor. The only large place to get um, marine gasoline for boats is over, at, you know, by Calf Pasture um, on the other Cove, side. Cove of Marina. Cove, thank you, John. Cove Marina. And there's one little pump on the South Norwalk Water Street side. And if we put in regulations that prohibit another gas uh, pump facility, you can't call it a gas station, whatever you wanna call it, mm -hmm. then you know, we need to think about that too. It, it sounds so minor, but there are a lot of boats here and they can't all you know, fill up at Cove Marina if we hope to keep this marine dependent use and get more mm -hmm. docks, which I'm, I'm in favor of. I really, you know, I hope John that the city invests in that. Maybe there's an added, you know, incentive well, for somebody can, who does who builds a allow new, it, new one. You can allow it as a you can include it as an allowed use. I think that's the best we could do under a zoning framework. You can't make people do things to that level of specificity. Yeah. <laughs> but we can include right. it no, as but, one but of the yeah. I'm afraid that we might somehow eliminate it by, you know, not um, not intentionally, but oh, because mm -hmm. now we, you can't have a gas station next to a residential building or something like that. You know, I don't know. Got it. Yeah, we can look into that. Okay. Well, very I think. Good, very good point. And you know, listen, we need to expand our footprint. And now we're going to be shrinking our marine footprint. And, and I get it that you need to, to incentivize these property owners or the subsequent property owners because there's a, a, a list of people that are just waiting for the outcomes to write a check for these properties and uh and 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 they have apartments in mind you yeah. know and, and that's what they want to do so we're going to lose a lot of valuable green resource such as it exists and it's what as it exists is not absolutely ideal either i i really buy into expanding it so it, we, it becomes more marine use not less mm -hmm. i do too just and i and i don't want to belabor the point or or be argumentative but i'm just taking a peek at the existing marine commercial zones and i mean the, 
maybe I won't even want to say this, but there, there's nothing preventing somebody from technically from subdividing some of these properties now that are deeper and they could cut them off. And then even though they're Marine commercial zone, the whole, a big chunk of the parcel wouldn't even be on the water. It would just be an inland Marine commercial parcel. So that, that changes the framework and the dynamic of it as well. So just, I think well, it, uh, some it, of uh, these can help need, protect you. Need, you need water access for a lot of these businesses to, to do business. Yeah, so I mean, I guess, I guess the, I know we're, we're kind of past our allotted time. So I do want to um, try and come to like a, a, a satisfactory conclusion so that we can, I think, I, I think that we're going to be, this is going to be the key issue that this plan continues to, you know, focus in on. This is obviously a, you know, a point of passion. It's a, you know, critical to the identity and economy of Norwalk. And so, you know, I want to reassure you that we're not going to stop short of like, you know, following these, all these questions to their, their next sort of logical conclusion. Um, but I do want to kind of just see if I've captured what, you know, what's been said tonight, some of our takeaways as we sort of move into the next phase. So I think what I'm, sorry, so Tim, I, like I, you have something to say. Yeah, I, I, I recommend that what, what might help with this is to drill a little bit more into the recipe of allowable uses and some of the conditions that would be imposed mm -hmm. with, you know, the rights to do upper floor development. In other words, you know, it might, it might be a, a menu of things and you have to pick three, or it might be you shall add, you know, X number of docks as a proportion of your parcel. And then you have to do two of the other things and you, they can only be marine uses. I think, I think to sort that out makes sense. I think the, the other thing is that um, I think we should dive into at a very high level some of the, the parking issues too, because you know, parking's key on these sites today. It's both people who work in the marinas, it's people who visit the marinas, it's boat storage, both, you know, for repair, you know, three seasons and then seasonal boat storage. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would say that behind the dock, you know, behind the docks and the immediate waterfront stuff, half those sites aren't very well utilized. I mean, I, I know that a lot of them get filled up with boat storage in the winter because they there's there's land there, but, if you, when we visited, and if you look at aerial photos, you know, as you can look at different years going back, the whole backlands of those parcels are are underutilized, except in, for for boat storage in the winter. And so, you know, I, I just think that, you know, taking twenty five percent of those parcels or thirty three percent of those parcels and and using them more intensively for other uses, um, still allows marinas to operate there. I think. Unless you think I'm wrong, John. Well, it, it's not going. The existing marinas that are there aren't going to get uh, on marinaized. They're going to they're going to continue in that that use in one fashion or another. We need more marina space. We need to develop some of these properties and maybe carve in landward. And it may it may even need, uh, necessitate a change in the federal ch channel that we have. We may have to get moved out because one of the illustrations showed a ramp and then some docks, but that would be into the federal channel. We, we need to facilitate in such a way that it's a big grandiose picture and we have other work underlying to do, which is another project for you. And actually, uh, Jessica Bonacek, slash Casey or Casey Bonacek. Her and I were talking about that this morning. She, she called me very early. And uh, we, we, we need to look forward for the big picture because our town is growing exponentially. We're building a tons and tons of apartment and I'm, apartments. And I'm not saying there isn't a need for Apartments. Personally, I'd rather see them be condos than apartments because it's a different connotation altogether as far as, you know, personal ownership. 
and the tax burden. So we, we, we come up with these, what, what, what would be a requirement to develop these properties? So let's see where we go from there and let us give it a little more thought. Because Zoe, God bless you, you're very bright, but you talk too fast. You've been, <laughs> you got this, all, this, all this information condensed in your brain and you go so fast, it's not that easy for me at least to wrap my arms around it. I get it. That's fair. But, but <laughs> I can, so, I can, I can speak slower. Speed. John, if she, if she talked at, at normal speed, we'd be here until midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, so it sounds like we have some clarity that the, the two next steps that Tim mentioned feel like the most useful way to kind of you know, spend our time between now and the next time we meet so that the next time we discuss this, we'll have something a little bit more concrete to sort of talk through in terms of how we tie um, this sort of the carrot of this, you know, new development opportunity or this sort of streamlined development opportunity and tie it back to the kind of inv investment that we want to see in this par these parcels, both in terms of the water dependent uses and also in terms of um, sort of resiliency um, sort of benefits and ecological benefits that um, folks have asked for. So I think we'll, we'll sort of do our homework to tie those things in. Um, and we'll also do a little bit of additional research on parking issues and do a little bit of additional coordination with DEEP about, um, about these ideas now that they're kind of pretty specific. Okay. This good is problem. This is a good problem to solve, I think. <laughs> This is Sabrina. Can I just make one yeah. recommendation that we also kind of take into consideration the market constraints um, of these types of projects? For example, like the chances of somebody developing a single story industrial building right now is probably not zero. Yep. <laughs> um, so just taking into consideration when we are doing like these mixes of uses and things like that, just keeping that in mind like as much as you know I would have 17 tenants that would love a brand new industrial building it's very low that that's going to pop up anytime soon so um just keeping those thoughts in mind while we go down this path of being more specific yeah those those in, the, in those graphics Sabrina those industrial buildings we just kept the existing ones out at the kind of in the marina zone just as a kind of demonstration that was still marina world but but you're right, if the, the site was more holistically redeveloped to, to improve the marina function, some of those functions would slide under the uses on the upper floors. Um, and then you might have some, some newer Butler buildings that might solve things that are necessary closer to the, to the water sheet, you know? So, um, but we, yeah, Sabrina, I, in, our, in our next staff meeting, we might, we might loop you in too. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, also, I just wanted to point out to to your point of mixing the uses, like banks probably won't fund a, a construction loan for certain types of uses that people might want to see, unfortunately. It's just how it works. Because um, if that was the case, we'd see new development now that's not solely, res that's not residential it would be something else if it made sense from the market side of things right if it made sense um so just making sure that we're thinking about that more holistically as much as you know we want to expand the waterfront uses and i really think the water dependent uses can be mixed in a smart fashion i think that's the only way we're going to see those uses actually remain as if we're incentivizing the mixing rather than just kind of a sole use. You're right, a much narrower bandwidth of developers have either because it's their own equity or through very particular financial tools they have like to tackle these more complex mixed use projects. But maybe we should talk about the Sabrina because maybe maybe this vision is juicy enough that that, that narrower bandwidth of developers might be interested, you know? Yeah, and I, we have some really good examples now, like obviously 50 Washington Street wasn't, and the Webster Street law is not on the waterfront, but we got some great proposals by doing an RFQ for that site. So I think like there's potential to really do some outreach once we've had, 
you know, a discussion about what the zoning is going to be and what we're looking for, that we could potentially get some creative developers that aren't just, you know, sole residential developers that come up with really creative kind of marine dependent uses mixed with other, you know, office or whatever it might be. I mean, I think that's an important point for this whole group that um, as we drill into a potential land use regulation mechanism to get the balance right, we've got a, a couple of pictures of what it looks like already. It becomes an economic development strategy that the city markets. And so to send the message to the market, this is what we have in mind. This is the character we want. You know, we want developers who are interested in tackling these more complicated mixed use projects. This is not Avalon showing up and just dropping their, you know, model 17 down. This is a, a slightly more customized development where um, the whole marketing advantage of living here is that you're, you're basically living next to and above a working marina area is the vision we want you to embrace from the beginning that has an impact on the market in cities. It really does. Um, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if the city is ever undertaking a, with, with a city ombudsman looking at what other marine industrial use sites in other states, uh, uh, other parts of Connecticut, what they've done and gone out and try to induce or interest um, users for those sites, small boat builders, uh, you know, di different companies that are marine related. I don't think we've ever done that. Yeah, John, I think that's what I'm kind of getting at is that if we have this holistic vision of what we're looking for and the zoning allows stuff like that to happen, then we can make, you know, the promotional materials or the ask out to developers including you know businesses as well to be exactly kind of what we're looking to happen yeah and what happens yes. john is that you incentivize the developers to seek those tenants to join with them to to have a more holistic development strategy i mean the city can can market directly to those potential users too but it would it would be a more sophisticated developer that's trying to meet the requirements of our our marine uses on the ground floor. They're gonna go seek potential uh, operators. Yeah, they're you know. looking for an anchor tenant, like the same way a, you know, a mall is looking for, a, you know, a, a department store, you know, they need their, their sort of key tenant to anchor their strategy. They're not making any more waterfront. Don't forget that, you know, Pinkley boats could have a great place there. They could make their boats, they could sell their boats and Norwalk should use its history. And Sabrina, you know, you're on the spot, you're there. This is what, you know, why we, why the city has you in place. And, and we need to be leading and not following with this type of stuff right we have an opportunity to lead rather than just have some developer come in and say well this is what i'll give you we have an asset and we have to market it properly Tim, i think um it's probably time to end this meeting uh, we've run about <laughs> Sorry, lou. Hour. I, I, lou i think it's your call and i'm glad that you brought that up as a topic um <laughs> i mean we, you know we work we, for you guys so <laughs> you call we, it we'll we'll leave <laughs> we can we can continue to uh, discuss this, but uh, I think that um, we're trying, if you, if you will, trying to do committee work um, in um, uh, a large format. And I think we ought to let you get back to uh, uh, working on these uh, smaller details um, so that we can move this process forward. Um, so I think we look forward to... Uh, Getting getting together at our next meeting. Um, Sounds good. All right. Yeah, well, we've got our homework uh, cut out for us, so we'll be we'll be working along getting some of these specifics together, so that we have a really uh, meaty discussion. And I'll I'll plan to go more slowly. Sounds good. <laughs> Look forward to it. All right. Uh, that, thanks, guys. Nice meeting. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for all. thanks for everybody's input. Yep. Uh, enjoy enjoy the conversations. Lou, and there's nothing wrong with brainstorming, and that's what we just did. <laughs>
Yes. It may be an exercise in futility, but we did it. <laughs> Thank you okay. all. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks all. Goodbye. Have a good evening.